This speaker is Neville Johnson. He passed away in September of 2019, but before that he walked with the Lord for uh, 45 to 50 years. He would literally see the Lord physically every single day. He would wait on the Lord. The Lord would come in and sit down with him, talk with him, counsel him. Angels would come, pick him up and take him places to do all different missions. He's been down into hell to receive um, King Solomon's crown of wisdom for the Lord. The Lord told him that, that he was going to distribute that uh, crown of wisdom across the earth in the last days, the end times. Um, Neville Johnson um, has also been translated over to uh, Queen Elizabeth's castle to give her messages also to what she has done. Um, his, most of his, a lot of his prophecies are coming to pass now um, that, he, that, that he's uh, passed away. Lots of it. Um, this is a end times last days channel for the remnant. The chosen, the elect, and um, learn, um, on this channel, what you'll learn about is uh, the Antichrist, the New World Order. Well, these are the things that uh, Devil Johnson talks about too: um, the One World Government, the One World Religion, One World Church, False Prophet, World Bank, Cashless Society, Mark of the Beast, World War Three, the Tribulation, the Rapture, One World Court, the Two Witnesses, the World, One World Economy, <laughs> World Military Force, the Economic Collapse. In World Council of Churches and more, also too, and these are important to know about. Uh, you're going to need to know about them just in case they happen in the next decade, the next ten or eleven years. So, um, it's uh, very, very possible. Um, we're at, we're at the, we're at the uh, tail end of the last days, so it's really time to press into God and and learn. Uh, it's crunch time for us to really build our relationships with the Lord, and this is a good way to do it: is to keep learning. Subscribe to the channel keep learning give a thumbs up it's a thumbs up ministry uh, where you give a thumbs up to, in, a, in, the, in the videos they uh, get spread around the world for um, and the more thumbs that it gets uh, all the different countries of the world and people can uh, learn about uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ from from all the thumbs ups so keep learning subscribe to the channel if you haven't already subscribed and um, God bless you guys enjoy the, the lesson today once again to the word for the week we're going to be talking about the return of the ark of the covenant today we've talked a little bit about that in the past but we need to take it a little further and uh, understand it a little better so we're going to talk about the returning of the ark of the covenant in first kings chapter 8 and verse 1 we're told that Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes and the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel unto King Solomon in Jerusalem in order that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And so it says, okay, they were bringing back the Ark of the Covenant. And in verse 2 of First Kings 8, verse 2, And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast of the month Etham, which is the seventh month. Now the seventh month is when the Feast of Tabernacles occurs. And all the elders of Israel came, the priests took up the ark, and the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord into its place, into the house, to the most holy place, even unto the wings of the Turbans. And so we have this, they bring him back the ark, putting it back in the temple. And they drew out the staves of the ends of it and put it into the holy place. And there they are unto this day. And so they brought it in, they removed the stakes. It was now permanent. It's in this was Solomon's temple that built. And the priest brought the ark into the temple, withdrew the slaves, and it was permanent. And, okay, so we've got this picture of these guys. They're in the temple. Then the holiest of all, the pull out of this, the pull of staves out, and they get out of there as quick as they can. And it says in 1 Kings 8, 10, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Okay? And verse 11, so that the priest could not stand to minister because the cloud of the glory of God had filled the house of the Lord. 
you see, this was in Solomon's temple, and it was is a picture of the end time church. But the key to this whole thing was bringing back the ark into the temple of the Lord, into the church, bringing back the ark. And this was speaking about the end time church. And it occurred on the Feast of Tabernacles, this last feast to be kept. And so it is a prophetic picture of these end times. And, uh, you know, we know God's been adding truth um, all, all through the ages, particularly from the Reformation on. And in Amos 9, 11, it says, In that day, now what day? In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David. Okay. That is fallen. And close up the breaches thereof. I will raise up its ruins. And I will build it as in the days of old. So, he's saying in that day. What day? This day in which we are living. I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. Okay. Just like it was, he said, in the days of David. So, you need to think and understand this because it's important. Bringing back the ark created an environment that was explosive. They came out of there, the glory of the Lord fell. People, the priests could not stand any longer in the temple, they all fell over. Doesn't sound like the normal church today, does it? But it is coming. At the same time, we said before, at the same time, in the temple, now the ark is in the covenant and the tabernacle of David, it's on Mount Zion, but in the old church, there was still continuing with life as normal, going through all of the rituals, but the ark wasn't there, the presence wasn't there. So we need to understand this background. And... Uh, See, the tabernacle of Moses wasn't far away at all. It was still functioning. But David had this on the mountain, and it was open. And so, it's important to understand that these two positions are going to be miles apart very quickly. Two positions of the church. One has an open heaven. One continues on with the normal rituals, you know, one will just continue running programs and so on. The other will run on the living presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, what we need to look at, the Ark in the, in, in the Old Testament was taken captive by the Philistines. And uh, it was put in the temple of Dagon. Now, we talked a little about this a few weeks back. Now, let's look at the process, though. It says in 1 Samuel 5, 2, when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon, all right, and set it by Dagon. Okay, this, this was a Philistine god, and it was one of their major gods. And in 1 Samuel 5, 3, and when they of Ashdod rose early in the morning, behold, Dagon was fallen on his face before the ark of the Lord, so they took Dagon and set him in a place again. Well, the next day, and when they arose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon was fallen again on his face before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and the palms of his hands broke off, and only the stump remained. See, when the tabernacle of David, when it truly the ark is brought back into the church and into our lives, the gods of this world are going to fall before the true church. Dagon just fell, broke up his hand, broke up his head. And uh, when it, the tabernacle of David is established in the church and in our hearts, the true church, the world, the gods of this world will bow before it. See Philippians Chapter 2, verse 10, it says that at the name of Jesus, every name should bow. Things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. Now, the appointment, when David became king, a new era was beginning in Israel and in the nation. So, 
David represented a man up in God's own heart. It's important to understand that. And that's what God is looking for today. Men and women who have a heart like God's heart. And so he decided <clears throat> that he was going to bring back. Meanwhile, the Philistines were having trouble with the ark. We've talked about that. And David, you know, is watching this. He's got an eye on this. The Philistines were having trouble with the ark. They decided to send it back to Israel. They couldn't handle it. The manifest presence of God, they couldn't handle that. And when it arrived in Israel, the Israelites had a lot of trouble with it. You know, the ark came to a place called Beth Shemesh. And the people there rejoiced because the ark was coming back to Israel. However, the men of Beth Shemesh lifted up the lid on the ark and 50,000 people died. There was one flash and they were all ash, you know? So that was quite 50,000 people. That is a lot of people in one hit. Why did this happen? I mean, why did this happen? It happened because they were not purified or sanctified enough to carry the Shekinah glory, the presence of the Lord. You know, this is one reason why God is moving today, requiring another level of sanctification, holiness, to get the church ready for the return of the Ark of the Covenant. We don't want 50,000 people in the church dying when the manifest presence of God explodes. And in 1 Samuel 6, 19, and he smote the men of Beth Shemesh, and they, because they had looked into the Ark of the Lord, even smote them, people, 50,000 people, three score and 10. And the people lamented, lamented, he said, because they had smitten so many people, they just opened the lid. You know, it sounds a bit like Indiana Jones. They just opened the lid, 50,000 people died. So, so the men in First Samuel 6.20, the men of Beth Shemesh said, who's able to stand? Who, who can stand before this holy God? And who's going to go up for us? First Samuel 7, 1 Samuel 7.1 And the men of kirjath Jerum came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill and sanctified Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. Now, uh, you know, they didn't know what to do with this. So they brought it to this poor guy called in, in Abinadab and said, you can keep it in your house. I mean, 50,000 people have died just by looking at it. And they wanted to put it in this guy's house. And uh, sanctified his son, Eliezer. And it came to pass that while the ark abode in Kirjathirim, that time was long, this guy had it in his house for 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after God. But it says God blessed this man's house. I bet he never went into that room for 20 years. But it was there. And God blessed his house. And, uh, you know, the church continued on with it, all of its rituals. But the Ark of the Covenant was in this guy's house. The question was, how were they going to bring back the ark? And that's our question today. How are we going to bring back the manifest presence of God? It's coming, but are we ready for this? So David gets involved. And in First Chronicles 13 and verse 3 gives another account of it. David said, and let us bring the ark of God back to us, for we inquired not about it in the time days of Saul. So... 1 Corinthians 13, 7. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart. Uh-oh. Bad move. They carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab. You know, he's been 20 years in this house. And as Uzzah and Ohio drove the cart. Eh, bad move. They tried to bring back the ark on a man-made cart. <clears throat> That's really important. You know, you know, all the promotions of so-called revival meetings is not going to bring back the ark. 
It's not going to bring back the manifest presence of God. We don't need a user-friendly church. We need a church where the ark is and the manifest presence of God is there in power of conviction of sin is present. So, how do they bring it back? And David and all Israel played before God. Now, it's second, we're in First Chronicles now, 13, 8. It says, so bring him back. We've got to bring it back. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might and with singing and with harps and with psalteries and timbrels and cymbals and trumpets. There was quite a do. And they came to the threshing floor. Uh-oh. A threshing floor of Chidon. And Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark for the oxen stumbled. And instantly he dropped dead. Now you think, well, it's not fair, you know. Um, the word that came to Chidon, and Chidon is the Hebrew word for destruction. A threshing floor, they came to a threshing floor. A threshing floor is designed to separate the true from the false, the wheat from the chaff. And when it came there, this guy got involved and died. So, how do they do this? So in First Chronicles 33, he said, Let's bring back the ark of God to us, for we inquired not of it in the days of Saul. So they put it on a new cart and began to transport it until it came to the threshing floor. Man put his hand on it and died. I thought, okay, how does that work? David was now confused. He was angry, actually, about this whole situation. How do we do this? The ark, you see, represents Jesus and the holiest of all. To be able to enter there, the priest had to be thoroughly sanctified. Now, as we enter this new season in God, God requires us to make a whole new level of consecration and sanctification to the Lord, because that's your kind of glory. It's going to come to the church, and we need to be ready for it. Sanctification means to set ourselves apart from that which contaminates us. And, um, okay. <clears throat> now, now let's look at the account of this in Second Samuel chapter 6, because it occurs, the record of this in different parts of the Bible. In 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 12, and it was told of King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed and That's where this guy had it for 20 years. And all that pertained to him, because the ark of God was in his house. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed into the city of David with gladness. <clears throat> now, David's thinking, 50,000 people dead. Okay. The ark was wobbling on a man-made cart. The guy touched it. He's dead. How do we do this? And David's thinking about, you know, how do we get this? How do we do it? Second Samuel 6, 13. And it was so when they bore the ark of the Lord, after it had gone six paces, he sacrificed offerings and fatlings. Okay. It's on his way. But note, every six paces, they stopped and made a sacrifice of oxen. Now, you yeah, think about this. It would have taken this procession weeks, months, weeks to reach Mount Zion. According to the Expositor's Bible Commentary, Volume 3, it said, you know, it would have taken them weeks and weeks and months to get to Zion because I had to stop on six paces, kill an oxen, prepare it, offer it as a sacrifice, and then go another six and do the same thing again. Every six paces, that's about 18 feet, roughly 18 feet on a journey, he kills the sacrifice and offers it up, would have taken weeks. You see, it's interesting. They came, they were dancing, 
and they were worshiping, they were singing, and uh, greatly highlights the missing ingredients in many of our churches today is that of true worship. You know, praise is not worship. Very few churches have really true worship. Um, Paul the Apostle really that spoke, spoke about this in Romans chapter 12. He said, I beseech you, Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And the word service here is the Hebrew word for worship. Okay. You see, we think, oh, we have a worship time. We sing and we think. <sighs> worship is the surrender of our lives to the Lord. It is a sacrifice, you know. And uh, it, it is, you know, finally David, get, David gets it right. And every six paces they went, they stopped. Take them weeks to get there. He's not going to take any chances with this. The ark, you see, represents Jesus Christ in you. You have a holy place where the ark is. Christ in you. In First Corinthians six nineteen is certain. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You see, in the temple of David and the temple of Solomon that brought the ark into the temple withdrew the staves. So it was now permanent. Now we are the temple of God. And the glory of God was manifest. What you know that your body, it says, that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are no longer your own. See, this kind of sacrifice, this kind of dedication, this is true worship. Your body no longer belongs to you, to us. It belongs to Jesus. It's the temple of the Lord. You are the temple. The holiest of all is in your spirit. So we see this process, that the final stage was to open up a new level of worship, sanctification, dedication, and that's where we are now. If we don't get this right, you know, the glory of the Lord's coming anyway. And so it says in First Kings 8, 2, And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto the king, Solomon, the feast of the month, seventh month, and the glory of the Lord came down. Hmm. The feast of tabernacles. Finally, David did get it, you know, onto Mount Zion. And it must have been a remarkable thing. You know, it's in an open tent. The people can actually see it. This was a big no-no in the Old Testament. I mean, we're totally out of character with the whole of the Old Testament. The ark in the Old Testament was hidden in the holiest of all behind the veil. Now it's in a tent. Everyone can see it. The veil, you see, was removed. Now, this is important. There is a veil that covers the ark within us. There's a veil that covers the ark within you. It's there in our spirit that there is a veil. And uh, it is a thing, a soulish veil. The life, soulish life, mind, emotions, and our will. That veil which covers us which has to be dealt with. In Isaiah 25 and verse 6, it says, In this mountain, he's talking about Mount Zion, shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people fat things, feasts of wines on the leaves, fat things of marrow, wines on the leaves, and well refined. And then he said this, I will destroy in this place, I will destroy in this mountain, the face of the covering cast over all people, and the veil, listen to me, that spread over the nations. Whoa. Now, in this place, when the Ark of the Covenant is manifest through us and within us, you see, it's also a national thing. He said, 
I will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over the people. But he also said the veil also that spread over the nations. So it's a national thing as well as a personal thing. The veil over nations are going to be removed. And this is important that we must discern this when that happens and be ready to move into those nations. The veil will be removed for a period of time. And then he goes on to say, when this happens, Isaiah 25, 8, he will swallow up death in victory and the Lord will wipe away tears from the faces and rebuke of all his people shall be taken away from off the earth. The Lord has spoken up. He said, this is what we have waited for, you see. Isaiah 25, 9, and it shall be said in that day, Lo, our God, we have waited for this. See, everybody's waiting for the next move of God. We're waiting for an outpouring of the Spirit. We were waiting, waiting for God to manifest Himself in a new, new way. This is our God. We have waited for Him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him and we're glad in Him. In verse Isaiah 25, 10, for in this mountain, the hand of the Lord shall rest. Mount Zion. Now, listen to me. The veil is going to be removed over some nations. Um, and when that happens, that it will be just for seasons. And when that happens, we need people to move in. You know, the veil was moved over Russia for a while, quite a lot of years ago. And you know who got in first? All of the cults. They got in for before the church did church came in after that. The Lord spoke to me many years ago when T.L. Osborne would die, that Cuba, the veil would be removed over Cuba, the curse over Cuba would be removed and the outpouring of the Spirit will come. Now T.L. Osborne died a few years back and right now, I'm telling you right now, over Cuba the veil is starting to be removed. And it better be God's people who get in there first before the cults do. And there are many cults swept into uh, Russia when there was that time and the wall came down and there was an open heaven for a period of time for the gospel to get in. But the cults get, got in like Jehovah's Witnesses and all other kinds of cults got in there ahead of the church. We need to be discerning, he said, this, on this mountain, you see, the veil shall be removed. I will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over the people and the veil that spread over the nations. We need to be very discerning about this. This is what we have waited for. And in this mountain, the hand of the Lord shall rest. This veil will be removed over nations for a season. Seasons. We must be very quick, ready to move. You know, Satan is often referred to as the god of this world. Um, the prince of the power of the air. He is also called the covering cherub. Thou art the anointed, see Ezekiel 28, 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covers. And he's talking about Lucifer, Satan. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set you so, and thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, and hast walked up and down amongst the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in all of your ways from the day that you were created, till iniquity, iniquity was found in you. We're talking about Lucifer. Thou art the anointed cherub that covers. Okay, there's a demonic covering, you see, over the earth caused by ruling demonic angelic spirits. We need to be aware of this because there'll, there'll be times when God will move, that covering will be, will, will be removed, time to get in. in. One nation after the other nation. You know, for instance, Indonesia is an interesting um, nation. It's the largest Islamic nation in the world and it's only a hundred miles off our northern coast. Now, 260 million people 
and it's the largest Islamic nation in the world. And the ruling fallen angel of that nation is called Garuda. That's the name of the fallen angel that rules over Indonesia. It's interesting, they call their, their airline, their national airline, Garuda Airlines. I wouldn't recommend that you fly with them. You know, but there come a time when it will break, we need to go in. You know, Argentina, the veil over Argentina in the 50s, in the early 60s, for a season of time broke, millions of people, over millions of people came to the Lord. That's how it works, the veil, the covering. Then there will be days of heaven upon earth during those seasons. Okay, how do we move on in design? How we do we move on to this place? David's tabernacle, Psalm 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend this hill of the Lord, Mount Zion? Who shall stand in this holy place? You see? He that hath clean hands, a pure heart, and hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive this blessing of the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation, now listen, this is the generation that them that seek him, that seek your face, O Jacob. So there must be, we're right there, and there must be a fresh sanctifying, you know. And this only you can do. It's time for a new level, consecration, sanctification for the Lord, you know. In order to be prepared, for what is coming. And it's coming very quickly. It will soon be the scenes starting to break out in various nations around the world. You'll see it. And the church better get in there first, the true church. But it'll break out. It's coming. And uh, it will be a glorious time. And we are called. We are the generation of the tabernacle of David. When the heavens will be open, the seasons, various parts of the world, and it will be a glorious time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But it requires now a whole new level of dedication to the Lord, sanctification of our lives, preparation for that which is about to come. Lord bless you. Subscribe to the channel. Listen to something every single day. Keep learning, Remnant. God bless you guys. Have a great day in Jesus' name. Give a thumbs up. It's a thumbs up ministry. Spread the, spread the gospel with your thumb. Have a great day.